You are listening to the Tri Order Transmissions Weekly Trek Episode 28. Welcome to Weekly Trek, your roundup of everything Star Trek that happened this week. Transportation of major updates, replication of new merch, Section 31 caliber fan speculation, whether you're off on a secret Starfleet mission or crash landed onto Kronos and missed out on all the Trek news this week, not to worry, Weekly Trek is here to catch you up. Joining me today is a very special guest and someone I hold in high regard in the Trek community. He's uh, a podcaster. A uh, hilarious dude and a wonderful person all around. Bill Smith of Trek Geeks is here. Hey, Bill. Hey, Shashank. Thank you so much for having me. It is great to finally get a chance to record with the uh, the more handsome and smarter half of Polytrex, I'm just saying. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> and speaking of Polytrex, uh, before we get into the news, I promise I won't, I won't keep this long, but uh, I don't think there would have been a Polytrex without Trek Geeks when we started out back in... August really when was the first time I met you, August of 2017, yep. and I met Barry also there, and he talked a lot about Trek Geeks and how you could actually do shows that might go out of the just the Trek of it all, and you could do something that matters in the community. And when we were coming up with Poly Treks, I went back and heard a lot of Trek Geeks. We discussed, there were days when we would just discuss, oh, do you remember how this Trek Geeks episode was done? That would be a good <laughs> format to do this in. So I, I promise that I'll do my best to keep it short, but thank you so much for Trek Geeks. Thank you so much for being a part of this community, man. You know, the thing I love about podcasting and Star Trek podcasting in particular is that it really is a community. I mean, there's no competition between any of these Star Trek podcasts. And I think we all inspire each other to some extent. So it's amazing to me that, that Trek Geeks even played the smallest of roles in Politrex getting off the ground because we largely make your face jokes and you guys talk about actual substantive things. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I often say Barry brings the smart and I bring the funny. So I'm, you're definitely talking to the less intelligent half today. That is for sure. Uh, I don't uh, know about that. I've heard you on Politrex. <laughs> you can hold your own with that Canadian dude. Speaking of Canadian dudes, we, we have some international news also to get, get to this week. But for those of us interested, on this week's episode, we will discuss the QMX release of the Scotty figure, or uh, as I'd like to put it, QMX gives the Scotty action figure everything it's got. <laughs> and <laughs> the New Zealand Mint beams up Spock. Treasure TOS items for uh, are up for auction. The Kelvinverse is coming to your phones. Megan Fox might be joining Star Trek. Rebecca Romain is number one in this first look from season two of Discovery. Laurel will battle the universe and sexism in season two, says Alex Kurtzman. And there are some fascinating numbers that we'd like to share with you. This is not directly Trek news, but it's it's something to show you the state of where things are with CBS and in a way also Star Trek. And before we get out of here, Carl Urban shared a very sweet Leonard Nimoy memory that we'd love to talk to you about. Uh, but let's get to the news. First up, there is this beautiful QMX action figure that depicts Scotty in all his uh, TOS glory. It's It's coming out soon, I believe. And there, this is another addition to their original series line. Uh, it's called the Master Series line. And a lot of exciting news here. But Bill, are you an action figure guy? Is this something that, that intrigues you? You know, I was an action figure guy back in the days of the early 90s with the Playmates action figures, the ones that looked a little bit cartoony. I, I've collected some of the other ones over the years. But to date, I haven't collected any of the Quantum Mechanics ones. But I think I'm going to revisit that now with the Scotty one. This one looks so much like Jimmy Doohan that it's really kind of uncanny. It's like they took one of those Madame Tussauds wax figures and shrunk it down into collectible size. I think it looks better than the Kirk and the Picard ones, to be honest. I think it looks more genuine. But I mean, it, it it looks like they could put this, you know, in a in a still photo from the '60s, and it would fit right in. I think it's it's truly breathtaking. So we're reporting this from comicbook.com, 
and they have a list of really interesting features that the figure has. They're not uncommon, but as an action figure collector myself, some of the things that are being done by QMX are not done by companies like Hasbro or Mattel, which are like the popular lines. So there is definitely some worth for your value here. There are things like a fully articulated body. They have a realistic portrait, which I can see from the figure. And there is a Starfleet standard issue black t-shirt that's under the tunic so they've gone out of their way i have a little bit of news on this maybe not news as much as an an insight from how the way i understand these things work i am a loot crate subscriber or i used to be (laughs) and i know you (laughs) and and i know you have a lot of uh, opinions on the loot crate service especially the star trek mission crate Uh, now given the timing of this figure's release I think this was actually knowing the way Loot Crate and QMX work. For those of you who don't know, outside of the Star Trek line at least, I've seen a lot of, in my two years of subscriptions, QMX figures come through my Loot Crate box. So I have a theory that they actually might have made this for that box, but the way that that disaster just exploded, I think now they're ready to release it on their own does that am I, am I completely off the ballpark here no i don't think you're necessarily you know out in left field on this one i think that's definitely possible i think that there have been a lot of missteps by both qmx and by loot crate with the star trek mission crate and i can believe that qmx may have had some of these things in the pipeline and for whatever reason um neither company has delivered on on the mission crate so uh, if this, in fact, was part of that particular effort, then I'm glad they're just finally releasing it to the general public because, honestly, I think it's going to sell better. Absolutely. Completely agree. There is uh, no reason for them to even keep going with anything Star Trek Mission Crate related. At this point, it's bad even for Loot Crate to keep pushing it out because that that was just horrible. And I, I really hate myself for recommending to, to the people I did. Barry, <laughs> Barry still hasn't forgiven me for that one. He says he has, but Canadians are just nice people. <laughs> speaking of... <laughs> uh, speaking of hyper detail, uh, we talked about another Mint using another Star Trek character a few weeks ago on Weekly Trek, but looks like this time the New Zealand Mint is taking on Spock in silver. It's a beautiful new mint that uh, they're they're going to release. It's a silver miniature of Spock in a, and it's done by the 3D master sculptor Alejandro Pereira Esquara, and it depicts him with his uh, Vulcan hand pose, and it's made out of a minimum of 150 grams pure silver, and it's about 10 centimeters tall. It looks beautiful. What what do you think? You know, it's it's really kind of amazing. You know, from, from the early 90s, I have a pewter Batman sculpture that has been on my desk ever since I, I got it, you know, in San Diego back, I want to say 93, 94. And I love that thing because it's just so detailed and it looks so much like Michael Keaton as Batman. When I take a look at this, this sculpture of, of Spock, I, it looks like Leonard Nimoy posed for this himself. And I think I, I like... Th- the things like the, um, the, the, not really wrinkles in the uniform, but the ridges where you can see the uniform isn't necessarily lying right. I like the detail on the tricorder. You know, I, I love the the Vulcan hand salute, you know, because it, it's like it, it's popped right out of the episode. This is, I wasn't necessarily considering this until we, you know, started reviewing links for Weekly Trek. But now I'm like, man, I may have to get this too. So my wallet could be a lot lighter by the time we're done this episode if we keep going this way, Shashank. Well, it's New Zealand, so I'm sure they'll take Kiwis instead of money. You might be okay there. <laughs> no offense to people in New Zealand. Not at all. A joke. Yeah. So, but uh, go ahead. What about you? I mean, you mentioned in the last segment you were an action figure guy. I mean, do these kinds of things uh, interest you when you see these types of sculptures? Uh, speaking of these two, the, I am definitely more interested in the Scotty figure mm-hmm. just because it's a seven inch figure and those are what I collect. If you meet action figure collectors, they'll have a type. It's like it's like dating, like how we have a type with whoever we date. Uh, there is a type of action figure collectors. There are people who collect only six or seven inch figures like I do. Sure. Then there are people who collect miniatures like this one. They're very rarely do people cross over. So this is not as much something that I'm interested in, but I, I might be interested in it just because they're only doing a thousand of them. 
according to the mint and it might be a collector's item sooner or later so uh speaking of just the detail it's beautiful you're absolutely right the figure looks great my one critique is the the stripes on his uh by his fists they they don't really look that good right the and they i guess in the original series they never actually popped out of the the uniform from what i remember they used to be inside the uniform or at least not this 3d but then they're selling it as a 3d figure and i also did some digging and if you add this to your cart it looks like it's 550 dollars so oh uh, i guess it's just <laughs> what you collect you know yeah well they have a kirk one too in their line which i, I find interesting and you know it's got kirk sort of holding his phaser i think he's wearing the uh the uh the the classic tunic as opposed to the kirk wrap and this seems to be a trend i I can only suspect that we'll see dr mccoy next they limited that series to a thousand uh statues also but um i it'll be interesting to see what happens to this over time because the kirk one is still also 550 dollars, so it hasn't dropped any um also just before we get out of this one i would probably buy it but i have a dog who will eat anything so my worry is if i buy this i'll have to dig it out of some poop at some point <laughs> the 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 fear is real shashank i understand all too well <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, sculptors and collector items we are reporting from forbes.com that there are a lot of iconic star trek and i'm sure you'll appreciate this the the older batman and the newer breaking bad series there are a lot of items that are up for auction at prop store there are apparently 400 lots from all these beloved tv shows and it will start on the 1st of december at which is a saturday and it's going to be held in valencia california and just a lot of details here but did you get to look at this article is there something here you're interested in bill you know it's interesting because I, i went to check my email the other day for trek geeks and I had about three different copies of this press announcement, um, all from different people, which was kind of fascinating. So they're clearly blanketing all of the Star Trek slash nerd sites. And I, I do think it's interesting. I mean, I, I was I was raised on the Adam West Batman. That, that whole bat shield that they're selling uh, is pretty iconic to me. I don't know that I'm going to have the kind of scratch that's going to be able to pick that thing up because they think it's going to be between four hundred thousand and six hundred thousand dollars U.S. Um, I, <laughs> I think I think I might want to buy a house before I do something like that. That's just me. It, the the uh, the Star Trek costumes I think are interesting. I mean they're uh, they're it's not exactly like a you know Starfleet uniforms or anything like that. Um, I believe it's from uh, what uh, bread and circuses, if if memory serves. The uh, the toga is worn by uh, Shatner, and um, it's, I think the other one's the Spock one, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. But you figure they're 50 years old. There's definitely some value there. I don't know that I'd want to spend five grand to pick up a bag of the fake blue meth that Walter White allegedly created in Breaking Bad. But um, man, I look at that bat shield every day, and I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. Looks like they also have things from TV shows like The Twilight Zone. And trust me, I'm sure there is some Breaking Bad fan out there who will spend that kind of money on that bag of blue sky meth. But is there any specific auction item, just maybe not available here, that you would genuinely spend a house worth of money for, oh, Bill? You know, it, it's pretty amazing. I, I think that there's... I would love the the captain's chair from the Enterprise from like Star Trek the motion picture, you know, sort of that era. You know, the one where the the armrests fold down and create almost a de facto seat belt for the only person on the ship. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I always thought that was kind of humorous. <laughs> um, the, the older I get, the more I love some of the design aesthetics from the motion picture. So I think I'd like to spend some time collecting some of those things uh, or maybe just some some outright long long age tos stuff nice i i and this is 100 percent serious i would really like the uh the para jumping outfits from the 2009 star trek oh yeah uh, the one that have uh, parachutes inside them <laughs> but they have to be fully functioning like i'll definitely spend an entire lifetime's worth of money if they need me to but as long as they're functioning i can actually jump out of ships and 
jump onto red matter devices and fight people. <laughs> now, you know, the interesting thing is people who might know me might have expected that I would bid on the Howard Stern's fart man uniform from the 1992 Video Music Awards <laughs> on MTV. But uh, I hate to disappoint everybody. That's not what I would go for in this lot. How dare you be mature on this podcast? I know. Yeah. I know. Tell me. It's 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 tough. I mean, I feel like I have to elevate my game, you know, appearing on the tricorder transmissions. So uh, I'm trying to do the best I can to adult. Yeah, one one of us needs to be smart about this. Uh, <laughs> by the way, speaking of the Kelvin verse, this has been going around. I think it also started trending on Twitter for a little bit. Have you heard of uh, the Fleet Command game that is beaming in on November 29th to our iOS and Android phones? It's going to be a an interactive. It, it's going to be a mix of things, from what I understand. There are going to be high definition cutscenes, and you're going to have strategy and role playing in there and the best part is they are all characters from the kelvin verse so a lot of news here but did you get a chance to look at this is this something you're interested in there you know they had a really subtle rollout or introduction of this the other day so there was a takeover of the star trek twitter account uh, allegedly by the klingon empire and they were tweeting all kinds of things about defeating the humans and the romulans and people were assuming that it had something to do with star trek discovery in fact, comicbook.com, which invariably reports things horribly wrong, reported that it actually was related to Discovery. Come to find out, you know, within an hour of this happening, that it actually was related to this game. So, you know, CBS and, and the Star Trek property are actually uh, adding a lot of uh, hype to this particular game. And I think it looks interesting. I, It's one that, you know, I will try it. You know, I, I have to confess that I get it. I get bored by mobile games very easily. You know, especially if there's no real end to them, if they just seem it's like, well, you know, you got to log in to collect your dilithium or, you know, your coins or whatever it is. I just I, I, I tire of them quickly and figure, well, you know, I've got better things to do with my phone, uh, like Anoy Shashank. So um, Which I, appreciate. I, I will try it out. Yeah, yeah, I will try it out. I guess um, they, they're taking requests to to join the uh, I don't know if it's going to be an all out beta or if it's going to be a, a workable beta starting on the 29th. But um, I do have my phone set to download it on that day. So we'll see. Maybe this is me being ignorant. But when that Klingon takeover happened, didn't they use a lot of uh, prime Klingon stuff as opposed to Kelvin verse. Like I never, from all the tweets and the images that they were sharing, I never saw anything that made me realize, oh wait, this might be connected to the Kelvin verse in any way. Like, am I wrong on that? It well, I I think that you know we've only seen such a small portion of you know Klingons represented in the in the Kelvin True. timeline that I think it really could have gone either way. Uh, you know, at first, it was some of the images. I mean, it was so obviously Kelvin verse from the looks of things like, you know, the Federation of Warp Nacelles and some of the graphics that were posted. And, and then, you know, come to find out that, you know, it, it really was Kelvin related. I thought it made sense. I think it's a good way to at least keep interest in that timeline going, not knowing the status of the fourth Star Trek movie at this time. But uh, I'll try it out. At the very least, they'll they'll have me for at least a day or two. And I guess um, maybe we'll see what they do to win me over at that point. Now, contrary to your opinion... Uh, or the way you perceive mobile I think they're too complex right now. Like I genuinely sit down and they stress me out. It's like, that is too many colors on a screen. Uh, I just, sure. Snake was it. The old Motorola black and white phone and Snake one line running through trying to catch the dot. That was my jam right there. <laughs> Anything more than that and it stresses me out. <laughs> but hey, while you're here, let me ask you, what do you think of uh, Star Trek Four status? Do you think that's ever going to happen? I think it'll happen. I think it'll happen without Chris Hemsworth. So you know, Paramount has made a huge mistake by essentially wanting to pay those two actors less than what they already committed to pay them contractually. So uh, I can understand why both the Chris's, Pine and Hemsworth, are like, yeah, I'm out. Um, because they were promised a, a particular sum of money for agreeing to do Star Trek Four, and now they're being lowballed by the studio. Uh, I still think Pine will sign on. You know, uh, you can't really have a Kelvin timeline movie necessarily without Captain Kirk, unless you're going to completely blow it up and focus on a, a brand new ship or or uh, a different set of characters. So uh, while I don't think we'll see his dad, I do think we'll see Chris Pine back in the captain's chair. I also think uh, Chris Pine's really successful franchise that he has led is Star Trek. I don't think there is any other that he, like A Wrinkle in Time didn't take off and he died in the first Wonder Woman. So he needs Star Trek as much as they need him at this point. 
So you're right. I think they will be coming back. But speaking of Chris Pine, in this game, before we get out of this one, looks like you can build your own teams. Looks like there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, play between networks. So they're also going very much in the vein of uh, Star Trek Online. Did you ever get a chance to play that? Bill? I have. I've tried it both on PC and on my Xbox One. I've heard also potentially that that could be coming to mobile as well as a rumor, so I'm not sure how much truth there is in that. But I think that, that mobile games is a, is a, an avenue where Star Trek has really not done as well. I think that they haven't necessarily been as forward-thinking in getting the property on that platform. So as as we're kind of in the midst of a bit of a Star Trek renaissance right now with you know one series happening and two more in development, I think that things like this make sense, even if it is the Kelvin timeline. So, While I mull over your thoughts from Star Trek Four, this is a crazy rumor. I'm going to say that outright. It could be anything. It could be nothing. Or it could be the biggest development yet on Star Trek Four. But the Merusu.com reports that mm, Megan Fox might be joining Star Trek. And this comes from a Twitter image that was shared that was going around they found i think on mary on megan's instagram that she was on a panel or some some sort of a round table with john Cho, and she shared that picture and some trekkie on it on on it found it and shared it with the star trek twitter account and asked them hey what is going on here and star trek just left a smiling emoji so we are really digging deep through a smiling emoji. I get that. But on the off chance that she actually might be joining Star Trek, isn't that awesome, Bill? I think it would be awesome, but I'm not buying this for a second. You know, uh, this is another one of those stories that, that initially started with comic book that that sort of made the rounds. Um, as you can tell, I don't have a whole lot of love for comic book. Um, unless they're reporting events they actually went to, they tend to lead with a lot of rumors and and this one just really seems kind of sloppy. Um, if I look at the photo, um, which looks like it also may have been like an Instagram story at some point, you know, John Cho and Megan Fox are in the middle of what looks like a, a, a really sparsely decorated living room set. And there are three other people that we can't identify. So I assume it's some sort of dis- panel discussion, maybe on something Cho has done, maybe on something somebody else on the panel has done, or maybe it's some kind of nerd discussion in general. But I... I think Star Trek uh, and the twi- their Twitter account is kind of trolling people a little bit. I could be wrong. I'll be happy if I'm wrong. But uh, I think that this got blown up all over the place, and I'm still scratching my head as to why. Uh, let me ask you then, if it's not Megan Fox joining us, it looks like there actually is room uh, since Anton Yelkin's departure that th- there is that space that needs to be occupied. Do you have ideas on who might be a good actor that might be a fit there and what who we could bring back from the Trek mythology to join us on the Enterprise? Well, that that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that one up. I, um, yeah, I've heard some people say that they should bring Jayla back. I, I don't think enough time will have passed for her to go all the way through Starfleet Academy and 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 to join up with the Enterprise crew. I just, I can't see that happening. You know, they could pick somebody like, um, oh, I don't know, um, Styles or Garavik or, or somebody else like that, one of the smaller characters in in uh, in Star Trek. Uh, Commander Kyle, mm-hmm. you know, as we see him in Star Trek Two as the the comm officer on the Reliant. Uh, maybe he's still a lieutenant at this point. He could fit the navigator spot. Uh, I think that there's a there's a wealth of possibilities. Uh, who knows? We could even see um, uh, maybe Ilea if if they you know sort of play around with it and and introduce her earlier than necessarily they would have in the motion picture so i think there's a lot of possibility there well all of that sounds great and while we sit down and wonder what happens to the kelvin enterprise on star trek looks like things are going great on discovery's uh star trek and specifically their enterprise we have a spoiler photo maybe not really a spoiler or a mild spoiler uh, on the appearance of number one in a Dis- discovery season two we found that star trek discovery revealed a first glimpse of newcomer rebecca romain on set and it was shared on their twitter account and we're reporting this from metro but i'm sure you saw this picture because i believe it went around quite a bit but we got a little bit of her in the last trailer that was released but now we have a full official photo of her in all her uh, 
Star Trek, the original series, kind of uniform glory. So until we get there, it looks like it's it's a, just a great picture. I have, I have a lot of thoughts on this one, but what do you think about this, Bill? You know, I see this image and it just, it makes me so excited. I, I was glad that they decided that they were going to introduce the number one character and that they cast Rebecca Romaine. I think it's, I think it's fantastic casting. In the photo on the, on the Metro website, it looks like she's being greeted by Pike, who's in a Discovery uniform. We know that happens from one of the trailers, uh, that he's at least on Discovery for some length of time, so puts on the Discovery ship's uniform. And number one beams over. Um, so I, I think this is fantastic. I, I, I want to know what kind of trouble the Enterprise is in and, and where the crew is. Uh, so it, I, I've got so many questions, and uh, um, thankfully we've only got just about two months to wait for answers. It looks like they're also definitely going to connect it to the Spock of it all. It, if it's not Spock-centric the entire season, Spock definitely will be playing a big role and where he is and what he's doing will play a big role. And if people remember it correctly, the cage has Spock and number one interacting too. So there is another character that could bring in an unexpected relationship dynamic between these three. And yeah, a lot of exciting things here. What did you think of her uniform? Is It looks very much like the uniform we saw of Anson Mount as Pike, but uh, there are some subtle changes. And I think maybe I'm going out of my way and reading too much into a picture uh, but from this and the one little scene that we got in the trailer, it looks like she's going to be a really great number one. I think you're right. You know, I think that they wouldn't have brought in somebody like Rebecca Romaine unless they were going to make this, you know, a, a really substantive part. I have a feeling that she's got a, a definite role to play in this season. I mean, you're right. Spock, I think, is going to play at least a major role in the first half of the season. You know, last year we kind of saw two halves of Discovery. We saw the Klingon War and we saw the Mirror Universe uh, after the the uh, mid-season break. So I'm at least counting on the first half of the season being very Spock-centric. Could be more than that, but when I look at Rebecca Romain in that, that Discovery version of the TOS uniform or TOS-style uniform because it likely evolves after this, um, it just it, it looks so cool. And I'm glad that they've put her in pants. Can I just say that? Because there's no reason why she shouldn't be wearing pants. If I remember correctly, in the cage, Mahel Biret wears a, almost a turtleneck, right? Yeah. And that was her uniform. So it'll be interesting. I, I'm really interested to see how they'll show, or maybe they'll never show us the, the evolution of these uniforms and how they go into what we, what we actually got in the original series. But going into some more Discovery Season 2 news, there is a... It looks like Alex, Alex Kurtzman has all the answers on where things are going with Star Trek. That's uh, no different with season two of Discovery. We are reporting this from Metro again. And he recently stated that Laurel is very much going to be portraying a modern workplace woman situation, especially someone in a position of power. And... I'm just going to quote him here. He said, uh, there is a female Klingon leading a warfaring, mostly male-dominated race. And he says, we are mirroring so much of what is happening in our world now. So it looks like Laurel finally will be getting that that character dynamic that we are all expecting her to to get to event. So uh, just a lot of thoughts on this. What, what did you think of this article? I think this article kind of confirms what, what I and many others have suspected all along. And that the writers of Star Trek Discovery are, are actually putting forth Star Trek type stories and situations. You know, Star Trek has always been a mirror for humanity. We just haven't always liked the reflection that stared back at us in the mirror. And I think that that's going to be true in this case as well. I think that this this very outward, very upfront, you know, uh, confront uh, confrontation of uh, sexism, whether it's part of the Klingon Empire or not, is very important to you know the, the social narrative that goes on today. We've always masked things in Star Trek via science fiction, and I think that that this makes perfect sense. You know, this is, for all we know, the first time there's been a, a woman chancellor of the Klingon Empire, and uh, Lorel has some definite challenges ahead of her, not just in trying to unite the houses, not just in being a woman, but remember, she's kind of holding the entire Klingon empire at bay with her hand on a literal detonator so i, I think that there's a, a variety of things here it seems very shakespearean to me and it has that definite potential i'm very excited to see what 
what happens here and also with with what Mary Chifo does as Laurel because I think she's absolutely wonderful. Uh, just one more quote that I want everyone to concentrate on on this article is uh, from the executive producer Heather Kaden who said sometimes it can be hard for women to have a position of power without being questioned. I don't know if you were aware of that. I don't know if she's being sarcastic with that last line but just a lot of uh, mirrors here a lot of uh, I'm definitely more interested not to take anything away from her storyline to see where Vogue or Ash comes into in all this. And w- what do you think? Is that going to be a dynamic that's going to play out? Do you think he's going to come back to Starfleet? I'm sure there is a way to reverse the surgery that was done on him. Do you think he'll go back to being Vogue? W- what do you think? I think we could potentially see some sort of hybrid. Um, and that's not the right word, but I'm not quite sure how to describe him yet. I think he'll be necessarily more Klingon than human, but perhaps he'll resemble more of the Klingons that some Star Trek fans would prefer. Or maybe he'll look closer to the TOS style Klingons that look, you know, mostly human with the exception of some really bad uh, mustaches for twirling as villains. I I think we'll see a definite significant part for Ash Tyler slash Voke. I just, I I have to believe he's probably going to be close to the right hand of Lorel because he did opt to go back to the Klingon Empire. And I think he's got his own challenges in trying to reintegrate to that society. What about their dynamic? Do you think that changes in any regard? Because throughout the first season, or at least most of it, we see Tyler as this trauma survivor. But toward the end, it looks like they mostly patch things up. Do you think that will change at all? Do you think there will be seeds of uh, mistrust in any way at all between them? I don't think it'll lead to any mistrust. I mean, remember when when Tyler was having those flashbacks and essentially what amounted to that uh, that post-traumatic stress, he believed that he was a captive being assaulted by his captor. It wasn't until later that he realized that, you know, when, when his Klingon side was fully awakened, that he was Voke and he remembered everything. So uh, there was you know, a a bit of a connection between Voke and Laurel in uh, early on in season one. And I I think that they may grow some of that. I think that they've got a lot to work through with the fact that, uh, you know, she essentially (laughs) brought him to a bunch of people who changed everything he was. I think he's still going to work through some of that. But I think that it will probably just lead to a closer relationship between the two of them. At least I kind of hope so, because otherwise Tyler's on an island and he's on an island in the middle of the Klingon Empire, which is not a good place to be. Absolutely. Before we get out of here, there is one article that might not relate directly to Star Trek, but it's it's kind of a State of the Union article on the third quarter of 2018 for CBS and all their affiliates. Uh, it, we are reporting this from PR Newswire, and looks like just good news all around for their revenues. Uh, from this article, we can see that revenues for the third quarter of 2018 increased 3%. To 3.26 billion from 3.17 billion dollars, and one very interesting quote is: "I'm just paraphrasing." They said, "Essentially, we turned in our best third quarter ever, and we continue to remain on track to achieve our 2018 outlook." And subscribing uh, across our platforms just keeps going up. So our must-have programming is driving those subscriber increases. So it, I think this is a just these are just facts that are direct statements that you can put in front of all the discovery naysayers and the gatekeepers who tell us that discovery shouldn't be canon and people should stop making this new trek because clearly it's working if it's not working critically which it is if it's not working for the fans which it is or most of them anyway it's also working in terms of money so i don't know where else you'd make that argument will I I agree with you 100%, Shashank. You know, if I look deeper into that article, it also tells us that subscription fees grew 32%, which was driven by higher station affiliation fees and revenues from digital initiatives, including CBS All Access. So this is a platform that CBS wanted to grow from the get-go. They wanted to compete with the Hulus and the Netflixes as far as original content. And this just proves that they're doing that. The other proof is that, well, we're getting more Star Trek. <laughs> you know, if you listen to the the Discovery naysayers out there, they'll say, well, you know, we're only getting new Star Trek because Discovery was such a failure. Uh, no, we're only getting new Star Trek because the platform is doing incredibly well. And 
CBS is in the business to make money, so they're going to give us more Star Trek. I think this is I think this is good news, especially if you're a Star Trek fan. I understand that some people may not want to pay the six dollars a month. I don't begrudge them that. I understand that others can't afford it, and I respect that you know entirely. However, there are a large number of people driving this increase, and CBS recognizes that this is the channel by which people are choosing to watch content. So I I think it's good all around. I think that in addition to the Picard series and the Lower Deck series, um, I think we'll see even more. I mean, it's a it's a universe that is rich with possibilities, as we've often heard. And and I think that numbers like this just reinforce the network's belief that, that that's the case. Okay, this is uh, now time for my recurring pitch on this show for the Sulu, a Star Trek story TV show. Let's go, guys. Make it happen. You're getting all the money. There are no excuses left anymore. But just to talk about that one point you made about uh, the entire reason why people are doing most traffic is because Discovery is a success. Let me just say this. And as someone who can objectively look at this without being, you know, putting on my Discovery fan glasses, if a show was a failure, an entire company wouldn't say, hey, you 12 people who make this show, here is um, half a billion dollars. So go and make more TV shows that are just as successful right. like as this one. Why is Akiva Goldsman on that Picard show if this discovery didn't work? Why, why is Alex Kurtzman still leading the whole thing if discovery was such a failure? Uh, like when people want to argue, I wish they'd take up these facts and then come at us because I genuinely like a good argument about why you'd think discovery might be a failure, but instead of that, you just people just like to fold their hands and go, nope, 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 discovery's a failure because I don't like it. Well, and look at the flip side of this too. You see Netflix canceling some of the Marvel shows because they haven't performed as well. And I'm talking primarily about Iron mm-hmm. Fist and mm-hmm. Luke Cage, you know, two of the key players in the Defenders series, which I'm sure will be next, quite honestly. But they haven't performed as well, and and Netflix recognizes it. I mean, they've tried to come up with so many Marvel shows that it's kind of hard to keep up with them all, and they all interweave. So I, I think that CBS realizes this too, which is why I think they're taking a rather cautious approach to unveiling more and different Star Trek because they don't want viewer fatigue as well. And I think that that's a mistake that Netflix made, you know, rather in rather large fashion. Have you seen season three of Daredevil, Bill? I have not yet. I know it came out. I've seen the first two and I like it. Although I hear that season three is also underperforming, which gives me concern. Oh, it's not just underperforming. They lost 50% of their viewers. And it's, it's, oh, wow. yeah, it's all the people who are like, you know what, I'll go watch it at some point. Uh, I think when the dust settles on that Netflix and Marvel situation, the only one that will be left is Jessica Jones because it's a fairly low budget show to produce and they it won them a Peabody Award. So they'll at least keep it around to get that kind of PR, but uh, not to spoil anything for Daredevil, but it looks like when it was being made, when you see the ending, you go, oh, well, that's how you end a show. You know, it, it felt like yeah. that to me. So it's, it's really cool when that is happening in the world of uh, really expensive TV shows being canceled, uh, that that unpredictability is happening. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, for us Trek fans, there is... Discovery, which is also obviously an expensive show to make, still continuing strong and other shows coming in the pipeline for this. So just I think to summarize our weekly track, we just have a lot of good news that we wanted to share. And one last article, we talk about Carl Urban and his many convention appearances often. He shared a very sweet Leonard Nimoy memory. Uh, We are reporting this from, I think, one of his convention appearances where he talked about how the one of his favorite memories of doing the movies was watching Leonard Nimoy put on those years after the longest time. So just a very sweet story that was shared that I thought, you know, just for those of us who might lose sight of all this in the toxicity of our community and all the negative stories that are thrown at us, just something I wanted to talk about. Did, did you get a chance to read this? Uh, have you ever gotten a chance to interact with Carl Urban in general? I haven't. Not anything more than a, a passing, you know, hallway, hey, Carl, kind of thing. But I have I've heard him tell a version of this story before um, that was that was much more brief. But when you hear this story, I don't know how any Star Trek fan, fan can do anything but smile, you know, because that's something we all wish we could see firsthand. You know, we see the 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 outcome, the byproduct of that work on the screen 
And to see Leonard just sort of inhabit that role on set had to be something that was just amazing to behold, especially for somebody like Carl Urban, who's a lifelong Star Trek fan. And then when you realize that J.J. Abrams is about to give direction to Spock, I mean, that's you're about to take somebody who is a pop culture icon, both as a person and as a character, and tell them how to play a scene. I can understand why that would be a little intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> uh I'm I'm so glad you feel that way, and absolutely, there is nothing you can do but smile and be joyful that this exists. And oh, as long as Star Trek exists, which I'm sure will surpass my lifetime at least, uh, we'll keep bringing this weekly Trek news to you. Hopefully, we can bring uh, Bill back on uh, on this, and he can give us some more of that sweet insight that he shared with us. But before we get out, Bill, uh, where can people find you? And I'm I'm sure for those of you who don't know, Bill hosts a little show called Trek Geeks, which is heard by tens of thousands of people. So calm down. I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, and if you haven't heard it, you should go and listen to it because Trek Geeks is awesome. But Bill, officially, where can people find you? Well, thank you, my friend. First, let me say uh, it was a, a great joy to be here with you today. It's been a lot of fun. This, You're right. This is a great time to be a Star Trek fan. And for those of you out there listening to this or, or who, who like whatever version of Star Trek you like, don't let any of the naysayers bring you down because they are such a small group of of shallow-minded people. Love Star Trek the way you love Star Trek and just be proud of it. So as Shashank said, you can find me on Trek Geeks, a Star Trek podcast, and also Discovering Trek, a Star Trek Discovery Companion, which is our Discovery-focused show. You just sort of keep the spoilers out of the main feed. You can find both of those at trekgeeks.com. And on the Twitters, I am at Trek Geek Bill. Uh, feel free to... Uh, to hit me up anytime and uh, we can talk about how awesome Star Trek is. People can find me on at gutter underscore hero, G-U-T-T-E-R underscore hero on Twitter, which is about the only social media thing I do. I also love good old email. So if you want to send me an email, you can do that on shashank.avaru at gmail.com. That's S-H-A-S-H-A-N-K dot A-V-V-A-R-U at gmail.com. You can find this show on at weekly Trek on Twitter. And that's the same name on Facebook. Please consider subscribing to us on Patreon also. We have a lot of exclusives, like 45 minutes of how I tried to talk my dog out of letting me uh, record an actual episode while we're doing poly treks called Puppy Treks. <laughs> 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 so a lot of interesting stuff there for sure. Uh, I, speaking of Puppy Treks, I also co-host a show regularly with a guy named Barry DeFord who might or might not be listening to this because he's the one who's going to be mixing this episode. Uh, Barry DeFord, we do a show called Polytrex, where we talk politics and culture from the purview of Star Trek. So just a lot of stuff that we wanted to catch you up on. I'm glad we got to most of it. Uh, there's always news that is coming down the pipeline. So stay tuned here with us and we'll catch you back next week. Until then, live long and prosper. 